The information below the video has links to freely available notes and to other related video tutorials. When an atom is split, that is nuclear fission, and this is the process by which we produce a large amount of energy in nuclear power stations. When atoms combine, that is nuclear fusion, and again a large amount of energy is produced. It seems strange that both of these opposite processes should produce energy, but as in many things in life, size matters. Except in exceptional circumstances, only small atoms can be combined, only small atoms can fuse, and only large atoms can be split, that is, undergo fission. Now, when protons and neutrons combine together to form a nucleus, they are at a much lower energy level than when they are separate. The difference in energy between the separate protons and neutrons and the combined protons and neutrons is called the binding energy. It's the energy that binds them together. So another way of defining the binding energy is that it's the amount of energy that would be needed to pull all the bits of the nucleus of an atom apart. So the binding energy per nucleon, which is shown on the y-axis of this graph, is the total binding energy for that atom, and the different atoms are shown on the x-axis, divided by the number of particles, that is, the number of protons and neutrons, in the nucleus. Those atoms with the most binding energy per nucleon are the most stable. So these are the atoms which are opposite the peak of the graph, which, if you read from the x-axis, are the atoms which have a nucleon number around 56, particularly iron. So the large atoms shaded here are more stable if they break in two. They will have a greater binding energy per nucleon. Smaller atoms, particularly hydrogen and perhaps helium, would be more stable if they combined to make bigger atoms. So why is it that these smaller atoms don't just join together? Well, there's a problem. The atoms are repulsive. Two small nuclei collide, strongly repel one another. The important forces here are the electromagnetic forces, kind of shaded here in red, which is the repulsion of the positive charges in the nucleus. The force which holds the protons and neutrons together within a nucleus is called, imaginatively, the strong force. As the name suggests, this is a very powerful force, but is very short range, and is indicated here by the green shading. So the only way we can get two small nuclei to fuse is to bang them so hard together that the strong forces can interact. And for that, they have to be going very fast. So for the greatest energy output, perhaps the best raw material, or at least the most plentiful, is hydrogen. Not hydrogen gas, but hydrogen plasma. Hydrogen atoms with the electrons stripped off, and not moving languidly around like this, but going very fast, in the sort of conditions that might be within a star, such as our Sun. The fusion of hydrogen into helium is the main driving power for stars. For the nuclei to have sufficient energy to fuse, the temperature must be very high, of the order of 15 million Celsius. But even at that temperature, the chances of a collision producing fusion are exceedingly small. And for continuous fusion, the pressure has to be extremely high, so that there are many collisions. Gravitational attraction provides the force to create a pressure of around 250 billion times atmospheric pressure, so that the density of the hydrogen at the centre is more than 10 times the density of lead. There are many different fusion reactions going on in the Sun but we think the one that produces the most energy is this. Two hydrogen nuclei, or single protons, fuse, emitting a positron and a neutrino, so that one of the protons becomes a neutron. The combination of proton and neutron, which is a deuterium nucleus, has a higher binding energy per particle than the individual protons. There is a loss of total mass converted to energy. 
In the next stage, one of these deuterium nuclei fuses with another proton. Again, there's a reduction in the overall mass, and energy and gamma radiation are produced. In the third stage, two helium-3 nuclei fuse. And in their collision, they produce helium-4 and two free protons. Once more, the combination has a higher binding energy per nucleon, a reduction in mass and a production of energy. So can we employ nuclear fusion to avoid a global energy crisis? Can we use it to keep our lights on and possibly a clean form of energy to avoid global warming? Well, perhaps, but not yet. The prospect is certainly attractive. The fuel required is abundant within seawater. The production of atmospheric pollutants or greenhouse gases would be virtually nil and radioactive byproducts would have at least a very short half-life. Perhaps the major project of the moment is the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, financed by a large consortium of states and hosted by the European Union. At the base of this project is a tokamak reactor. With building started in 2013, it's not expected to be thoroughly functional for a decade. The major technical problem with all these reactors is to contain this exceptionally hot plasma at exceptionally high pressures, which the tokamak seeks to do with a toroidal magnetic field, which at the same time induces a current within the plasma which keeps it hot. The key to success is maintaining stable plasma whilst producing significantly more energy than the electromagnetic field requires. Using a completely different approach, the largest inertial confinement fusion project runs in the US. This project uses powerful laser beams. These are fired at a small capsule of fuel, something like deuterium. The heating of that fuel is so massive that the outer layer of gas forms a plasma which explodes outwards. That outward explosion leads to reaction, a compressive shock wave that goes down into the centre of the capsule, causing the temperature in there to rise to as much as 100 million degrees and for the pressure to rise so far that the density of the material is 20 times that of lead. That results in a fusion reaction which uses a high proportion, but not all, of the fuel. Thus far, this US project and others like it struggle to produce continuous output that exceeds the energy input. But both projects show promise and the prize for success is huge. Thank you for watching. The links here are to related YouTube videos and there are relevant notes on the website.